Right, morning everyone. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm just going to run through same old procedures as normal. So this is um, a webinar, so I can't see or hear you like normal Zoom events. Um, if you've got anything that you would like to sort of say to the other um, viewers or anything uh, relating to whether you can't hear me or anything, please do use the chat function. The only thing I would say is just remember on the little bit where it says two, to remember to collect, uh, select the bit where it says all panelists and attendees, because technically the panelists are just me and Ben. Um, so otherwise you're only messaging just ourselves. So um, if you've got anything that you want other people to see, then make sure you have it on attendees as well. Um, if you've got specific questions that you'd like to ask Ben, uh, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. Um, and there is actually a Q&A function um, within the webinar of Zoom. So you can simply click on that and type in your question and um, we'll, we'll have a session at the end answering about that. Um, ben, as usual, will have his video off um, just because he's uh, living somewhere fairly remote and the bandwidth just isn't enough for him to talk and have his video at the same time, which we learned early on. Um, and I'll be sharing my screen for him. So he'll just be prompting me to go on to the next slide. Um, the other thing that we've got uh, this time is uh, where Ben has a few slides asking questions. I have decided to add in the little poll function, which is completely anonymous. So we can't see who's selected which answer for the question. Um, but I just thought it would be a little bit more interactive. Um, and so we'll just pause for a little moment on those slides just so people can have a go at doing the quizzes. And they're multiple choice as well. Um, the, me, this whole webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as we normally do. Um, so if you need to dash off, then that's absolutely fine. You can just watch the rest of it later. Equally, if you have any kind of internet problems and you get dropped, it drops out, then you can just rewatch it later. Um, it's also worth saying that I think when Ben and I have found that um, after about an hour, it's good to have a little mini comfort break at about 11 o'clock, just for everyone to go and um, sort of use the facilities or freshen up with another cup of coffee or something. So um, Ben and I usually sort of decide that between ourselves as we go along. So, uh, morning, Ben. How are you doing? Are you okay? Hi, I'm okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. I can hear you good. perfectly. That's good. Well, okay. Um, well, I will just get everything set up then for you to begin. I will turn off my video and mute myself, if that's okay, and just start when you're ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who are sort of attending. I can see it says 27 participants. Um, that's good. Um, so as with all the other um, NPMS sessions, the, the, there's a kind of illustrated tour through the habitat looking at um, characteristic species and um, views at the more kind of habitat plant community level to help uh, people to identify when the, when they're in the habitat and what are the similar habitats and so on. Um, so, uh, if we move on, Sarah's going to go on through the um, through the slides here yeah, because of the bandwidth problem here in this. I wouldn't say terribly remote place, but we're up in the hills um, in 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 Scotland. So, um, as with other NPMS um, sessions, I've begun them with a wee little poem, and this one is a short one. It's the same one as I had last year for the Southland Grassland one. Um, introductory poem. Grass is green, but flowers few, monotony in store for you. Plants of many different kinds, confusion for your wretched minds. Classifying grassland type, groan and gripe, tears to wipe, not much fun, but here you came, you've only got yourself to blame. Well, there's a positive start, yeah. Um, and well, kind of like as usual, misery and happiness, they're kind of, uh, they kind of go together. I think it's something to do with the British sense of humor maybe. Um, and we can move on to the next slide and find that actually, when I was saying about confusion and all that kind of stuff, um, potentially there is, potentially there is of any kind of um, definition of, uh, of plant communities and habitat types, just as with identifying tricky species. Um, but they don't all have to be that tricky, just a few uh, things to get our heads around to um, help with definitions. Um, and one thing about the 
um, this upland grassland broad habitat that is potentially confusing is that the two fine scale habitats that it's divided into both have the word montane in them, montane acid and montane calcareous and grasslands. Um, and upland and montane are not necessarily the same thing. Montane is really a kind of subdivision of upland. Upland, uh, as you can see in that map, that's uh, based on a climatic index of, of temperature and humidity. So the areas of the country with a more kind of upland climate are shown in brown, the cooler, wetter areas. And that kind of climate is reflected very much in the vegetation. So upland vegetation that reflects a cooler, wetter upland climate can be found right down to sea level in the far northwest. Um, further south and east you go, the more it's restricted to higher altitudes. Um, Montane is only a very small part in terms of total area, very small part of that brown upland area, too small to really um, try to show with another colour on, on this map. It's areas where the, where the climate is really pretty seriously harsh to such a degree that um, things like woodland are not on the cards, it's not, um, it's not natural to have proper woodland growing. Um, you can get some kind of montane scrub here and there, but it's uh, it is really is a particularly harsh climate, and that is reflected in the vegetation um, in very very particular ways. We find montane species there. Um, so um, that that was potentially a bit confusing when I first looked at the um, the names of these types. But on the next page. We've got uh, a kind of um, solution, uh, what I figured when I was looking through the NPMS guidance was firstly on the acid side that even though that, that fine scale habitat is called montane acid grassland, it actually refers to all kind of upland acid grassland, you could tell by the descriptions of it, uh, the species and everything. Um, and, and it also actually includes some vegetation dominated by ferns and um, in the most montane areas, so snow beds and summit heats. So we can take that what's called montane acid grassland as meaning generally upland acid grassland and some other related kinds of vegetation. On the calcareous side, it's a little bit more complex in that the NPMS description seemed to refer um, quite a mo bit more specifically to the truly montane calcareous grasslands. Um, but then some, some aspects of it seem to be taking in the um, grass as calcareous grasslands that are upland but not montane. Of course, upland but not montane is an awful lot more extensive than truly montane. And there's nowhere else really in the NPMS guidance for putting the um, upland calcareous grasslands that are not montane. Um, so really it's right that they should all be put in here with the exception of those dominated by the blue moor grass, it says Laria, um, for which it says, it specifies in the guidance that um, says Laria uh, grasslands on Carboniferous limestone in Northern England and Scotland uh, belong in the lowland grassland broad habitat, which is a funny thing really, because some of those are actually very much um, upland areas. Uh, it's really referring to Northern England because even though Cesleria does grow here and there in Scotland, it's not really on limestone and it's not in not forming a grassland sward. So um, to um, to summarise that, the montane acid grassland fine scale habitat can be said to be generally all upland acid grassland. The um, calcareous equivalent can be said to be all calcareous upland grassland with the exception of that that is dominated by Cesleria, uh, which is very local in its distribution of course. Um, so um, if we go on to the next page we can begin going through the acid. If we, if we look at the acid one first and then the calcareous one after that. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so it says that even though I said at the beginning there, at the top of this page, so let's look at the montane acid grassland fine scale habitat type. We can read it as upland, really. It'd be better if it was just called upland acid grassland. Um, and here are three species that are very, very common in it, so much so that you really do, do need to know these ones. They help to recognize the habitat because they're all characteristic of um, acid places for the most part. Wavy hair grass on the left, there's Champsia flexuosa. It's a beautiful grass, it's got this kind of 
branched um, inflorescence, uh, which when when it opens out, of course, they, they begin quite closed in as most grass um, inflorescences do, but those that are branched then can open out later into um, these with these widely spreading branches that are um, very have very thin stalks that are rather wavy. That might have given it its name, but they also um, sort of generally wave about in a bit of a wind. There's other reasons why it could be called wavy. Um, and those silvery, um, slightly purpley tinged spikelets, very, uh, very distinctive as well. Um, equally, the leaves, it's one of the minority of grass species that have leaves that are so thin, they're very thin and wiry, no more than about a millimetre wide. Um, and in that sense, it looks a bit like things like red fescue and sheep's fescue and mat grass, nardus stricta, which we'll, we'll see these um, a bit later. Suffice to say, you can tell it from the most similar looking ones, which are those fescues, sheep's fescue and red fescue. You can tell it from those by having a look at a few shoots and get to see where there's the ligule, that little projection um, coming up at the base of the leaf blade. And it's up to about three millimeters long in the wavy hair grass. In the case of the fescues, it's really, really short, very um, incredibly short, you, you, you barely see it. Um, so that'll separate those. Um, tormentil, pretty distinctive thing with leaves, with three leaflets to them, with quite distinct teeth towards the um, ends of those leaflets. Um, and little yellow flowers with mostly four petals occasionally you get a five petaled one um, and you can get a couple of little stipules uh, well you do get a couple of little stipules they're like little leaflets at the at the um, leaf base so it can look like they've got five um, leaflets um, very 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 common plant especially on acid ground although in upland areas it can also grow in calcareous grasslands as well in the lowlands not really um, so it's a, one of the commonest plant species in upland areas especially on acid soils heath bed straw is more strongly restricted to acid soils a bit more like the wavy hair grass on the left um, really really common in so many acid kind of habitats and it's one of the best indicators of acid grasslands in general really how you know if we're looking at species to separate acid grasslands um, whether they be upland or lowland to separate them from neutral or calcareous grasslands the heath bed straw is a particular sort of um, species to remember for the acid side as is the wavy hair grass those two are much the, the, the tormentil slightly less so generally hints at acid, but if you're in the uplands, it can also be on some of the some some of the calcareous and even some of the neutral grasslands. OK, um, if we go on to the next page, we'll see a more of a sward of wavy hair grass whose um, flower heads haven't really opened out to the degree that they were in the previous photo. Um, and it's accompanied by a whole load of heath bed straw absolute classic acid grassland combination there and um, <clears throat> the the wavy hair grass is very commonly found in mixtures with other grasses like fescues and sweet vernal grass um, mat grass and so on um, but in some places it actually dominates especially where there's been some kind of previous disturbance to the ground like felling of conifer plantation or burning of heath um, it seems to get a competitive edge following a period of disturbance and that can go on for quite a while, quite some years until eventually other grasses come in and you get more of a mixed sward. Um, so um, there's some um, typical acid grassland that's just up the road from where I live here and the next page shows us some of these other grasses that typically um, grow with the wavy hair grass in most of our acid grasslands. Common bent um, has, has a branched head, a bit like that of wavy hair grass, except it's got more branches and they come in regular, more regular kind of whorls, little, little groups. It's a more sort of, um, got a more sort of even structure to it, whereas the wavy hair grass head's quite uneven with the sort of gappy appearance. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and um, it's got broader leaves. You wouldn't ever mistake it for, for wavy hair grass. Uh, likewise, sweet vernal grass, uh, border leaves as well, and that very distinctive flower head, which is um, kind of rather a shiny green, as in that photo uh, when they first come out in spring and early summer. But then 
um, they die off to a sort of pale golden color and they remain for quite a long time through well into the autumn and even early winter, which is pretty handy because then you can tell that species easily. But if you haven't got those, those flower heads, you can always tell sweet vernal grass by looking at the base of the leaf blade as in that insect photo and you've got those long hairs um, around by where the ligule is. There is a ligule, it's hidden by the stem in that photo pretty ordinary looking the gill a few million up to a few millimeters long but um, it's those long hairs that really um, uh, help to identify it if we haven't got the flower heads the leaf taste of almonds by the way it's another feature of it um, the sheep's fescue and the red fescue they've got these very thin wiry leaves like those of the wavy hair grass but as I said earlier the ligule is very very short and the flower heads are different as well red fescue is pretty branched um, quite widely branched um, with uh, bigger spikelets than those of the wavy hair grass on the whole, um, bigger and longer um, and not so shiny. They've got more of a matte finish. And the leaves growing up the stems of the red fescue are not so thin and wiry, they've actually got a bit of width to them. Um, Whereas the sheep's fescue, all the leaves are wiry. It's a smaller plant than the red fescue, smaller than the wavy hair grass as well. So if you see a, um, a wiry leaf grass that is really on the sort of small side with leaves, not very long, up to about 15 centimetres, then it's probably going to be that one. And the flower head's not so um, openly branched as that of the red fescue. Um, both those fescues are very common in um, upland acid grasslands. Um, the sheep's fescue tends to prefer kind of thin, thinner soils and doesn't compete quite so well with um, other grasses, like if the grazing is not very intensive, you know, then they kind of lose out to things like the agrostis, the, the bent grass and, um, and sweet vernal grass. Yorkshire fog on the right is a bit more distinctive. It's got a softly hairy texture all over the, the leaves and the leaf sheaths and the, um, the flowers that are sort of a bigger, thicker texture and quite almost blobby looking and with a pinkish tinge, it's beautiful grass. The lower leaf sheaths have um, often have a stripy effect with a uh, purpley color to it. People call it stripy pajamas. Um, a very distinct, um, easy thing to tell. And I've noted there at the bottom, that the common bent and sweet vernal grass, funnily enough, are listed as negative indicators in this fine scale habitat type, which seems a bit funny because they're just so common in all kinds of unimproved acid grassland, um, you know, including really, really decent quality acid grasslands. I personally, I don't view them as negative indicators at all. Um, anyway, let's go on to the next page and we'll see some more colorful plants, some herbs that we can find in these upland acid grasslands. Um, Germander speedwell, beautiful plant. You can tell it always, even without the flowers, um, those blue flowers, you, you can always tell it by looking at the stem and the hairs on the stem. It's like they've been combed into two lines um, on opposite sides of the stem. Nothing else like that. The stem's often quite dark, uh, purpley tinged as well, which helps to see those hairs that are paler. Um, there's a thing called wood speedwell, which looks broadly similar, but grows mainly in, in woods. Germander speedwell grows in woods as well, by the way, but wood speedwell doesn't grow out in grasslands, especially acid ones. And it has hairs that stick out in all directions around the stem. Um, heath speedwell is rather hairy as well, but the leaves are a different shape. They taper very gradually down to their bases and the teeth don't look quite so sharp. And the flower spike is this more of a definite sort of spike and it's rather low creeping thing much of it and then the, the um uh the shoots for the flower spikes sort of curling curling up there so it's a nice little plant very very common easy to identify both of those speed bells have got leaves in opposite pairs by the way which is another feature of speed wells in general um milkworts leaves quite different they're not toothed um the lower leaves are in opposite pairs um but uh whereas in the in the common milkwort um, none of the leaves are in opposite pairs and that gets a bit bigger and that's mainly on more calcareous ground. So if you find heath, um, if, if you find any kind of milkwort with those little very neat, almost slightly leathery textured and rather dark leaves and these funny looking um, dull bluish flowers, 
if you find a milkwort in um, upland areas in general, it's most likely to be heath milkwort, and especially if it's accompanied by plants such as tormentil and heath bed straw in anywhere that looks like an acid habitat, then that's the one that we get. Um, Bitter vetch, beautiful vetch, because a lot of vetches have very tiny little leaflets arranged in rows left and right along a leaf stalk. Um, bitter vetch doesn't have so many, but it makes up for that uh, by the fact that the leaflets are quite big. They're either they're either quite long, or uh, like long and narrow, or they're um, they're very really quite broad, um, properly kind of leafy. Well, they're all leaves. Even wiry leaves are leafy, of course. But you know, a real kind of what you might call think of a, a, a leafy, generous kind of look to it. Beautiful plants and the flowers. Again, um, you know how some vetches have loads of flowers all arranged in a spike. Um, lots of little ones. Well, this one has flowers. Individual flowers are on the big side, and there aren't that really aren't very many of them. Um, so it's kind of, what do they say, um, less is more or something like that, you know. It's, uh, it's making, um, making good with not great numbers. Um, and the colour of the flowers is nice too. It's, um, it's, it's very common in some of the acid grasslands, especially those that aren't too strongly acid, where there's maybe just a bit of flushing, a little bit of mineral enrichment. Lousworth likes acid grasslands, especially maybe where it's a bit on the damper side. Easy thing to tell because uh, those leaves are really kind of divided up into more than lobes. It's like just all kinds of such complicated divisions. They're just looking we're quite a mess, you might say. Um, if somebody tried to draw it with a pencil and they just thought, oh, I can't be bothered with this, and they just draw a whole lot of squiggles going in and out, then that's the kind of effect you get. It's pretty untidy. Um, the flowers are relatively large for the small size of the plant and the very low stature of it. Um, Nothing else like it, I suppose, apart from marsh lousewort, which grows in very different places in wetlands that are on more neutral to calcareous soils, and it grows taller. Has, and it has a branching system a bit more like a, a spruce tree or something with whorls of branches coming out at different points above ground, whereas in the little ordinary lousewort, the, um, uh, the branches all come down at the base. Um, so there's some herbs of the acid grasslands, and another page, the next page, has some more. Uh, lesser stitchwort, related to the wood stitchwort, that's probably the plant more familiar to most people. Um, lesser stitchwort is uh, lesser in its dimensions, um, not, not in its worth, of course. Um, flower petals, uh, flowers are a bit smaller, uh, petals narrower, distinctly narrower petals, leaves definitely smaller, stems really kind of wiry, and it creeps around. Um, around and up amongst all kinds of grasses and other plants in these acid grasslands, especially acid grasslands, again, that aren't too strongly acid. Pignut, likewise, that likes acid grasslands, but the, the most really sort of um, nutrient poor ones, especially on thinner soils, we don't find so much of it. Um, but very common, it's an umbella for uh, things like um, hem, uh, what do you call them, um, hogweed and cow parsley are the more familiar umbella for, and they're so much bigger. But yeah, um, they can, um, benefits can be pretty small and pig nuts, one of the more slender ones, goes up to maybe about 30, 40 centimetres um, in, in height and little umbels. The leaves are very, very intricately divided, beautiful looking leaves, quite a uh, regular form to each leaf, triangular shape um, in the manner of some ferns, of course, that have leaves divided like that. Easy one to tell. If you find violets with their heart-shaped leaves, in uh, as, um, as you we can't really see the heart, you can just about see the heart shape in that photo. But you know how violets have heart-shaped leaves for the most part, most violets. Um, then the main one that you're going to find in acid upland grasslands is the common dog violet, uh, and it's really pretty common in those as well as in other very different habitats such as woodland. Um, in flower, it's distinct because that pale, or that, that spur thing at the back of the flower is pale, much paler than the purpley colour of the petals. And um, the, oh, it's listed in the NPMS as a positive indicator in the montane calcareous grassland habitat, but it's just as common really in the acid grasslands too. Um, mountain pansy, I've put in two photographs there because the colour varies from purple, flowers can be just about solid purple or all yellow, apart from those little little stripes. Um, flowers are really very big, 
compared with the low size of the plants and compared with other kinds of um, violets and pansies, they're all in the same genus. Yeah, beautiful little plants that grows um, in acid grasslands in the uplands and it will grow in some of the calcareous grasslands as well and it's listed again in the NPMS as a positive indicator for those for the montane calcareous uh, fine scale habitat but if anything it's slightly commoner I would say definitely a bit commoner on on the more acid side those kinds of upland acid grasslands that are again not so too strongly acid, but maybe just a little bit of flushing or en enrichment of some kind, but still basically acid grasslands, unimproved acid grasslands, always a good sign to see mountain pansy in, in a grassland. Um, next page has got some dwarf shrubs. Um, we can find these growing in acid grasslands. Uh, if we get more than 25% cover of them, then we'll be classing it in NPMS terms as a heath. Um, but yeah, scattered, very sparsely scattered plants of any of these dwarf shrubs can occur in um, in an upland acid grassland. Um, heather and bell heather with those purpley flowers, they're distinct from each other. The heather's got much smaller and much paler flowers and the leaves are tiny, whereas bell heather's leaves are in worlds of three and they're longer. Um, the other three species have got broader, well, the first two have got broader leaves and the, the crowberry at the end is a bit like bell heather, but the leaves are thicker with a white stripe underneath and it doesn't have those pink flowers. But the, the bilberry, or we call it blaeberry here in Scotland, and they give it other names elsewhere, and the, and the cowberry, they've got these oval leaves. Um, easy to tell, the bilberry, the leaves are toothed and they fall off in the autumn um, and at any time of year you can tell it by those stems that are green and distinctly ridged. Um, and um, of course it's got the fruits and it's got little kind of greenish pinkish flowers um, in the sort of spring, early summer. Um, the, the, the cowberry is equally distinct, its stems are much more ordinary than those of the bilberry, but the leaves are kind of leathery and evergreen with slightly downturned edges, and they don't look so toothed either, they don't have quite, they don't have so many teeth, and anyway the leaves are rather, because they're enrolled around the edges, um, that would hide, or try to hide what teeth there are, and its berries go red. Um, so yeah, dwarf, dwarf shrubs that we can find in um, acid grasslands. There, and uh, next page has got a view of some um, typical acid grassland, a bit like the picture we had with the wavy hair grass and the heath bed straw. Um, but we've also got tormentil. That's absolutely classic acid grassland look there with um, a sward that's dotted with white and yellow. The white of the heath bed straw, the yellow of the um, tormentil, and a fair mix of grasses. You can see the um, sweet vernal grass flowering heads quite conspicuous there. Um, and there's a few other things. There's some, um, there's some wavy hair grass in there and some fescues. Uh, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a mix of grasses. There's a bit of, bit of mat grass too. We'll see some mat grass in a bit closer view. Okay, um, the next page has another example of acid grassland. People often think that acid grassland is not so interesting you know, if they're thinking in terms of grasslands more broadly, people tend to home in and say, oh, is there any limestone about? Let's get in there for the calcareous grassland, or maybe a kind of herb-rich neutral grassland with all its, all its colours, that kind of lowland meadow kind of thing. Um, and, but, you know, acid grassland, even though, yeah, admittedly quite a lot of them can be on the species poor side, some of them are surprisingly species rich or herb-rich or colourful, like this one here, with a whole load of mountain pansy, um, it's got some Germander Speedwell, the blue of that, and some the whites of the heath bed straw, and there's eyebright in there, um, and the yellow, this tormentil. But there's also, funny enough, there's bulbous buttercup in this one, which is, uh, is mainly found in um, neutral, unimproved, neutral and calcareous grasslands. But this is an acid grassland, as is clear from its general makeup, the whole mix of grasses and um, herbs, including tormentil and heath bed straw. Uh, and the mountain pansy is very much, you know, more an acid, um, acid grassland plant as well. But it's just a sort of a enriched kind of acid grassland, one way to look at it, on soils that have um, got a bit of mineral enrichment. Uh, so, yeah, they can be, they can be tremendously rich, species rich, if you were to measure it in terms of 
whatever number of species per square meter or that kind of thing. Um, there are plenty of examples of acid grassland that are um, as rich as good neutral and calcareous grasslands and even richer than some of the less rich neutral and calcareous grasslands. So yeah, acid grassland is, is good stuff. And actually even the species poor acid grasslands, just because they're species poor, doesn't mean they're bad. Some of them may be naturally species poor, like some of the heaths. Um, it's still just as interesting. Okay, the next uh, picture has got a whole sward of, well, a sward of grasses and a whole um, population, I should say, of, uh, the, of betony, which is a more southern species. Uh, I was very pleased to find it in some acid grassland uh, in Perthshire here, which is pretty much at its northern limits in Britain. It's great population. It's, um, it is found mainly in acid and neutral grasslands and is equally, like, like the mountain pansy, it's one of those species that um, can show in an acid grassland, can show us that it's not quite so strongly acid. Um, it's particularly common, um, well anyway, really south of the um, English-Scottish border, so it pretty suddenly becomes a lot more common. Um, so, uh, a distinctive plant that we can find in slightly richer acid grasslands there. Uh, next page is uh, going in a different direction, not so obviously um, rich or species rich or colourful. We've got um, mat grass, Nardus stricta, which I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, very, very common grass in so many upland acid grasslands. It's uh, got wiry leaves like the fescues and the um, wavy hair grass, but it's a very dense tussock. You see that top right picture there, really kind of dense, and the leaves are pretty stiff and, um, and rough textured as well compared to those wavy hair grass and the fescues, which are a bit softer. Um, but if you're in any doubt, best thing to do is to um, to look down at the base of the plant and you'll see where the leaf blades leave the sheathing part of the leaf. Um, it, there's a sudden sort of junction there to a sharp angle. The leaf blade sticks right out, not quite at right angles, but almost so, and in some probably it is at right angles, really sharp, purposeful um, angle there. You don't get that in those other wiry leaf species. If the plant's in flower, that helps as it does with most plants really you know the um, the top right has got um, <clears throat> flowers uh, sort of in flower you could say they're just very very dark spikes it's a it's an unbranched spike of um, with a, a sort of series of very narrow very dark spikelets that are held pretty much close to the stem so close that it just looks like a dark line you might some people might look at it and not even pick up that it's um, a flowering head but uh, when the flowers are over and they die away, it goes very, very pale and the individual spikelets stick out, especially on, more on one side than, other, than the other sides. And it has a kind of um, fishbone uh, look to it. So very, very distinctive, that um, unmistakable flower head. But if in doubt, check out those lower parts of the plant and you'll see those, <coughs> those leaves coming out at an angle. Uh, oh, it's very, very common. It's, it's a very tough textured plant. So it's no surprise that animals like sheep and deer, <clears throat> they're not that keen on it. They will graze it, but generally only as a last resort, it, it seems, if, they're, um, if, there aren't, if there's hardly anything in the way of other grasses there. They much prefer um, softer grasses like um, bent grass and, and fescues, and wavy hair grass, <clears throat> and so on, and, and uh, sweet fernal grass. Uh, so what happens is that this species, the nardus, um, gets to be very common where the animals have grazed out so much of the other grasses, that's left space for the nardus to colonise. It's a bit of a, you might say, a bully among grasses. It gets in there um, and, um, and takes over at the expense of the other things where, the, where their abundance has been reduced by that of, um, of by grazing. Uh, if it's not so grazed, those other softer leaf grasses will actually gradually come back in and even outcompete the nardus. So the nardus in itself can't can't really compete that well unless something is there to suppress the other grasses. And in most places, it's going to be grazing that does that. But as you go higher up in the mountains, as we'll see later on, cold temperature can do it, especially snow lie. 
Anyway, uh, that's for later. We can move on there to the next picture and see that um, all, although most of our nardus, mat grass, grassland is rather species poor, some of it is actually quite species rich, as is the case here. Uh, some might say, well, there's not much to look at, it's just grassland, you know, amongst some uh, pretty acid looking dry heath. But um, that's one of these places where, because it's in a little slight depression, there's a bit of flushing coming through, bringing with it some. Um, evidently anyway some mineral enrichment as reflected in the flora so when we look close too close to be able to see in this photo we can find quite a lot of other stuff in there that reflects that enrichment um, i've mentioned them there there are fen beds draw ladies beds draw meadow street and so on you can see the marsh thistle poking up um, you can get quite a lot of good stuff actually in these <clears throat> these flushed nardus grasslands it's not a very common habitat quite a special kind of grassland really um, most in the largest grassland is not like that. Okay, um, next um, slide has got um, these some some questions, and um, I I know um, yeah, it's <laughs> just been said about this. So I, I I and this is all new to me. This, <laughs> yeah. this system. So I'll I'll leave this to, uh, <laughs> to yeah, Sarah. So I've maybe. I've just I've just put the poll up. Um, so it's just got those two those two questions with the three multiple choice options here um, and it's completely anonymous so just click on whichever ones that you think are correct for those two questions and it will just be interesting for us to see sort of uh, how many people have been paying attention maybe and <laughs> things like that um, and each time there's a question slide we'll 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 have a look and um, and then when uh, everyone's or whoever, whoever wants to vote I can end polling and share it with everyone and you can see and then on the next slide um, Ben will go through the answers anyway so just give it um, a little bit of time can you see it on there Ben yeah I can yeah, yeah. It's I can quite, see the blue line filling yeah up. so obviously it's designed in a way that's um, more to do with polling on an option rather than a correct answer but um, this just seems to be a good way of of doing it so hmm. yeah okay. oh is that one of the blue lines went down as well so people can change their answers uh yeah possibly i think so um uh, or is it that when they're submitted that's it i don't know <laughs> yeah um so i think nearly everyone has voted um, I think there's still a few people, but not everyone has to. It's obviously not compulsory. Some people might be just listening. Uh, and if I end polling and then share results, you can see that um, the majority of the people went with um, the, op the first option for without flowers about the leaf blade sticking out abruptly. And for the second question, most people went with uh, it has a longer ligule than those other two fescues. So um, I will... Um, stop sharing that, mute myself, and you can go on and explain the answers. Yeah, this is a good system, this, isn't it? Because you can see, um, yeah, I've seen the different, um, the different results. And yeah, it's so everybody got the analysis right. Brilliant. And yeah, the wavy hair grass, its ligule is longer. Some people have thought it was shorter, but no, it's the, it's the fescues that have the really, really short ligule. Um, as I um, made a bit of silly writing in there, well, you can't probably see it, it's behind the, the polling thing. Um, and um, the ligule being a ring of hairs, that's not obviously, that's not the wavy hair grass. There are a very few grasses that um, don't have an actual ligule, but they have a ring of hairs there instead, things like purple moor grass um, and, uh, and phragmites and heath grass, just a very, very few species and uh, no the wavy hair grass isn't one of them so it's ligule is longer than um, than the ligule of the fescues uh, so good oh well, thanks everybody for um putting those those answers in and does the is that that polling thing going to just disappear now is it i think i'll just wait for it to um it's, it's not something that we Click. Oh, wait a minute. I can click it off. Done it. <laughs> I was waiting for it to, to go on its own. Um, so, yeah, and there's the answers on there. Um, 
a bit more more um, legible a bit of flying saucer and some people from outer space trying to trying to work out how to describe the shortness of the fescue um, ligules because in Hubbard's book it didn't actually give dimensions it just said very short and extremely short it's a great book Hubbard on grasses and it's uh, it's an old book but it's got such great detail um, fantastic book and um, okay we can um, go on looking at some more species here with heath thrush. Heath he thrush is a bit like um, that uh, nardus, the mat grass, in that it's a very dense, <coughs> densely tufted plant. It's obviously it's not grass, it's a rush, but it's very densely tufted with relatively wiry leaves, but they're actually quite a bit thicker, uh, both in width and depth, um, than those of the, um, of the mat grass. But yeah, really, really tough, not very palatable, and um, its main, its stem, its flowering stem is really, really tough, really, uh, uh, very, very, very strong. You can, but can't, uh, hard to imagine animals eating their way through that. And then it's got a sort of little branched rush type of, of head, but it's always very easy to tell because of the dense rosette at the base of the plant of all these glossy, tough, thick, um, wi wiry, but thick textured leaves. And yeah, it's similar to the Nardus in that it's not palatable and it spreads in the same way. It could be, can easily get overcome by other grasses, softer growing plants, if the grazing pressure is not too high. But it benefits where other, where the animals take out those other species, giving it space to um, sort of expand and become abundant or even dominant in some places. And there on the lower right is an example of the, uh, heath thrush dominated vegetation which is a kind of acid grassland in terms of all of its feet other species that grow with it it's, a, it's like a grassland and is within this NPMS habitat as well um, in with with those grasslands so that kind of olivey colored brownish green colored very characteristic of um, heath thrush vegetation and in that photo on the lower right we can also see the very pale tussocks of nardus the old leaves of nardus they go really really pale um, <clears throat> so they can be easy to pick out at a distance patches of uh, nardus grassland um, both the Nardus grassland and the heath thrush vegetation are particularly common on acid soils, a moderate way or you know quite a long way up the hills. They will come down to low altitudes, but not so commonly. They're, they're, they're mostly at sort of more medium to high altitudes. Um, okay, we can go on to the next picture and see a few of these other kinds of vegetation that aren't strictly grasslands, but they do come within the NPMS um, um, what, what's called the montane acid grassland fine scale habitat. Um, fern vegetation <clears throat> to start with, the, um, the most extensive, most common one of these by far is bracken dominated vegetation in which we get swords of bracken that are either, they, they vary from almost pure bracken, just bracken fronds over a, a litter layer through to um, bracken with basically an acid grassland type of flora underneath. Uh, it's very, very extensive, that kind of bracken vegetation. And um, uh, you can get other plants occasionally, like bluebells can be pretty common in, in some of it too. Um, but yeah, we count that in with the acid grassland habitat. So if, the, <clears throat> if, if the flora growing with the bracken is more heathy, like heather and bell heather and blaeberry, um, then that's a better place with in the heathland habitat and you will tend to find that kind of bracken vegetation in close association with heathland um, but yeah very common to find acid grasslands in, uh, in a mosaic with bracken vegetation that's got a grassy understory and counted, counted in the same habitat. Um, the next page has got a couple of other ferns, a lemon scented fern on the left and the um, alien male fern on the right. Um, again, the flora that we have growing with among and beneath these ferns tend, tends mostly to be more or less of an acid grassland type. Um, so they belong in this category for NPMS purposes. Um, the lemon scented fern vegetation is mostly on north to northeast facing or north to east facing slopes. It likes a cool and humid 
kind of microclimate. Um, and indeed, it can get a bit damp in some of these places, damp enough to get a few other plants like marsh violets <coughs> um, and uh, polytricum moss. It's, uh, but for the most part, it's got um, so much in the way of um, an acid grassland flora, generally, that it's, uh, it's fitting to count it in here in the MPMS. Um, the other one, the scaly male fern, is not restricted to um, slopes of any particular aspect. It's quite varied, really. You can take it more sunny, south facing, um, um, and it's a very distinctive plant, great big tussocks of it. And um, yeah, nothing much more to say. Well, you could say loads more things really about it in terms of its structure and everything, but it's uh, um, it can be very species poor amongst those tussocks. They're very, very big and dense. Uh, but um, there are other other ferns. Occasionally you'll find stands of um, male fern, broad buckle fern, lady fern, those species in similar situations or mixtures of different kinds of ferns. Um, and they all they'll all be similar, treated similarly in the MPMS, put them into this this category here. Um, but the commonest ones are these two species. Um, apart from bracken, of course, which is commonest of all. Next page has the greater wood rush, which in places where the grazing level isn't too high, this species can become very, very common or dominant and can be, in fact, overwhelmingly dominant uh, where it really gets going. Um, and the, it's the easy thing to tell. It's kind of slightly grass-like. It's got these rather broad leaves of a uh, tough fibrous sort of texture. You can always tell wood rushes from grasses or sedges <clears throat> because the leaves along their edges, they've got white hairs that aren't like um, in so many plants that the, the sort of pale colored hairs are very clearly um, growing <clears throat> from the leaf surface or along the leaf margin in a kind of regular kind of way. But in wood rushes, they're very loose they can get really very long irregular length ir and irregular sort of patterning and it's they they look rather like as if there's been some kind of sticky stuff along the edges of the leaf and then maybe something like some miniature sheep with bits of wool come off them have stuck onto the edges of those leaves in a kind of untidy and irregular way um, and looking like they could just pull off very easily which they probably could i haven't tried actually that's something to do um, see how easily the hairs pull off wood rush leaves. Uh, but the yeah, unmistakable thing, greater wood rush is by far the biggest of all our British wood rushes. There aren't that many of them anyway, but it's it's a great big thing. Uh, the flowering stems get up to 50 or so centimetres tall and they've got a very, a very branched head with lots of tiny little brown rush type flowers. But just the, the bulk of the whole plant, big tussocks of it and the leaves up to about maybe a centimetre or so, or at least a centimetre wide, <clears throat> and big tough thing. Uh, very palatable to animals, so it's very common to find the ends of these bitten off, but um, that depends obviously on, on how much grazing there is. And in places where grazing levels have been high in the past, but then have been reduced, maybe by a fence going up for um, planting conifers or something, because you find a lot of this in in open areas among conifer plantations, then what can happen is that this thing, this wood rush gets going and so spreads quite a lot before there's enough time for other palatable species like some of the dwarf shrubs to really thicken up. Um, and so some of these places might have been heaths beforehand, then grazed down to a grassland um, and then grazing released. And then this luzula, this wood rush coming in and taking over. Anyway, that's probably enough said about um, about that. Let's move on. <laughs> and here's another actual grass. Mm. Down south, southwest England and the very far south of Wales. Another tussocky grass with wiry leaves. So it looks a bit like um, wavy hair grass or um, sheep's or red fescue. But um, the leaves, the leaves are start, slightly on the stiff side. So it's a little bit like Nardus in that way. But the leaves don't stick out at those white angles at the bases. Um, and they're a slightly greyish green, and the flower head is very, very branched. Um, the, it's a bit like the flower, the, like the common bent, actually, except the branches don't stick out very widely, but you can prise them open. And um, 
and find that this has got lots it's got a lot more branches than the wavy hair grass um, so it's quite it's quite a different plant to the wavy hair grass though its habitat is rather similar acid ground and it does very well where there's been some previous disturbance especially from burning um, but always easy, easy to tell from the wavy hair grass because of those stiffer grayer leaves and a completely different flower head um, it grows in grasslands and in heaths uh, on soils that range from dry to rather damp. Okay, um, we can go on now to um, to look at the the more high altitude and more, the more truly montane end of things with acid grasslands, because what we've been seeing so far has been stuff that's upland, very much upland, but not um, in the actual montane zone. Um, and um, generally speaking, in the montane zone, things are a bit shorter. Um, mosses can be very common, um, particularly particularly common certain certain kinds of moss. Um, here's an example of some very short fescue curagross. This is a little bent fescue grassland with very pale tussocks of mat grass that's on top of a mountain in um, Wales. <coughs> And the next picture has another example. You see the pale swords there, that's the mat grass, Nardus stricta, which we've already seen. Um, and the sward of it here looks much of a muchness really compared with other mat grass swords, but it is actually a more, a, rather a more natural one because in most places, a sward that's dominated by the mat grass is gonna be a rather unnatural feature because it's dependent on heavy grazing, um, unnaturally heavy, uh, unnaturally high intensity of grazing to take the other grasses out to give the mat grass enough space to, um, to sort of fill in and dominate. Here in these places high up in the hills, it's snow that does it, late lying snow um, as here on the edge of this, um, this ridge where the shady aspects has uh, had the snow lying longer, there's still a bit of it left there as you see and the snow suppresses the growth of other plant species, those other palatable grasses, and um, that gives the Nardus the, a good competitive edge. Um, just above it, it's more windswept, and the snow doesn't lie for so long, and we've got a quite different assemblage there that will still be in the same NPMS category, by the way, pretty much all that ground that you can see will be unless there are little patches of heath further down the slope on the left but yeah the stuff um, in the foreground on the ridge top is sort of very short um, <clears throat> mainly moss and sedge vegetation I think called stiff sedge and um, some racometria moss we'll see close-ups of those in a bit uh, so there's quite a distinct difference when we get into the montane zone um, a difference between habitats where snow lies for quite a long time on relatively sheltered slopes and the shorter vegetation of um, more windswept ground that can be very close by. Okay, another one coming up here of some montane grassland on acid soils. This is uh, tufted hair grass, Deschampia sespitosa, which low down, you probably know the species, it's a big tusky thing, grows very tall. Um, up in the hills, it grows a lot shorter, but still relatively sizable, you know, compared with some of the other grasses. Everything was a bit dwarfed um, high up into the montane zone. But this is still has got uh, um, enough substance to catch the eye and look like quite a quite a sort of thick, um, almost lush kind of sward with things like heath bed straw and tormentil, uh, especially in places where it's just below some um, snowbed vegetation and you get a trickle of, of cold water coming down um, quite a lot through the spring and summer. Um, but in that photo, you can't really see very much uh, <clears throat> that, um, you know, very close range that will separate it from um, a non-montane grass. And so on the next page, we've got some close-ups of some of the species that we find in acid grasslands in the truly montane zone the um, species that help to um, show that effect of the harsh montane climate. Stiff sedge on the left is um, one of the commoner ones. 
It's got relatively broad leaves for a sedge. It's pretty low grown, the leaves spread out quite widely and they're rather greyish green. And um, that can be true of some other sedges that are much more common, of course, like carnation sedge and glaucus sedge and common sedge. They've all got rather greyish tinged leaves, but this one's different. The, um, the, leaves, the leaves are really quite broad, much broader than the leaves of common sedge, Carex nigra, and they spread out very widely, whereas common sedge leaves stick up more. Uh, carnation sedge leaves are much paler and glaucous sedge leaves are a bit darker on the top but distinctly paler underneath and they did tend not to get quite as broad as the leaves of the stiff sedge. So there are differences all um, from all of those. And once you've got that flower head up there, it's really easy to tell because it's a thick stem with a distinctly triangular um, section. It's almost like wings on the stem. Um, thick and stiff with all the flower spikes, um, spikelets clustered up near the top, unmistakable. Least willow, it's, it's a lovely little thing, it's very, very small. Its leaves are a bit like, they, they can be remarkably similar to the leaves of bilberry. Similar size, um, they've got teeth around the edge and they fall off at the end of the year. <clears throat> and, uh, but they're a bit, on the whole, a bit rounder um, and they've got more of a textured upper surface with all those little veins kind of sunk in uh, a sort of, sort of wrinkled texture to it. And the, um, uh, uh, to the left and the right of the main central vein tends to very commonly fold up either way like a valley. Um, so you get some more, more of a sort of light dark effect where, where you get sort of light and shadow. On it, whereas the bilberry leaves are a bit flatter. Um, and of course it doesn't have the ridged green stem that bilberry has. Alpine ladies mantle, you're never going to mistake that for anything because it's so starry that other ladies mantles have got leaves cut into lobes um, that don't get cut all the way down um, to the very middle of the leaf, but in this one they're cut into leaflets. And they've got a very silvery colour underneath and that silvery colour extends right out to the edges. It's like someone's come along with a very fine silver pen and, um, and drawn in detail to emphasise the, the, the shape of the edges and those little teeth along them. And um, it'd be wonderful if we did have, actually there is a such thing as a silver pen and a silver coloured pencil, but they never work very well. I've tried them. Um, so I've not tried them for that purpose, actually on leaves, this is on paper, of course. But you'll never mistake the Alpine Lady's Mantle for anything. Um, it can grow equally common in acid and calcareous grasslands in the montane zone, whereas those other two species are more common on the acid side. Uh, next page has got some more things that we get in the montane um, zone. And I'm just thinking it won't be long before we can move, uh, before we can take a wee bit of a break. If we, if we look at, well, certainly this, this picture, we've got some club mosses, um, which are not, well, they're actually related to ferns. Um, uh, but they look a bit, bit mossy, but, but they've got much more thick textured stems, tougher leaves, almost woody. Um, Alpine club moss is unmistakable. It's almost like little bits of Lawson cypress stuck to the ground because the leaves are very scaly, um, short, relatively broad and overlapping. Um, never mistake that for anything. And it tends to have a greyish kind of glaucousy green colour. Fir club moss is easy to tell as well because it's, it's got lots of branches and they all arise from the base. It's almost like a kind of toy plant, I often think. It looks has that kind of look to it and the leaves are pretty tough. Um, Three leaf drush forms tussocks that can get quite big, typically have that kind of goldeny brown tinge uh, because of the to towards the outer parts of the leaves of the shoots anyway. And these very small little um, little flowers where the where, where the leaves um, leave the stem. It's it, it's a plant of the very much the high montane zone, so it's really very restricted in its distribution but can be very abundant or even dominant in some places like on the Cairngorm Plateau. Um, those two club mosses are not restricted to the montane zone. They can come down, come down quite a lot lower in places, especially where competition has been reduced. So it gives them a bit, bit more space. So many of these montane plants really need a bit of space around them uh, and would happily grow in places where the climate is not so harsh, except that in those places, 
a lot of other plants will um, do better and outcompete them. So maybe it's five past 11, maybe that's a place to take a break because the next pictures from here are at the habitat level and we've been looking at species. Yeah, that's, that's um, fine then. Um, I've so got it, about that? yeah, I've got it at 10.59 um, at the moment. Um, All right. I, my <laughs> clock's running fast. That's the clock oh. on. Um, I've, I've got an actual clock on the table. I should I should put it back. I'm so it's eleven. It's eleven on the nose now. So shall we meet? Um, yeah. Back at five past then. Um, Brilliant. So everyone can just take a little little comfort break, and we'll be back here at five past eleven to continue. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, right. Are you okay to continue now, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Good. And um, we can move on to the next next picture. And uh, I was just amazed that when we stopped, we'd been going for an hour and I was still drinking my same cup of coffee that I'd had when we started and it was still hot enough to drink. I've got this plastic mug. It's got some amazing thermal properties, it seems, that holds the heat remarkably well. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, the, um, here are some pictures now at the kind of habitat level of the vegetation in the truly montane zone. Um, uh, showing, showing sort of plant communities that um, are within the MPMS uh, montane what's it called, montane acid grass and fine scale habitat type at the truly montane end. So they're not all obvious um, grasslands. And um, this one here is largely moss, a moss called Rachmitrium lanuginosum. There's a term called Rachmitrium heath that people have been using for many years to describe vegetation of lots of mountain tops. And it's a kind of grayish green, um, colour because the, the moss itself, which you'll see, in fact we can go on to the next picture now as a close-up of it, it's quite a big moss and the leaves have white hair points at their tips. So from a distance it gives it a sort of whitish greyish tinge and it, um, it's a very very common um, species of moss in a whole wide range of habitats, um, mainly in upland areas. Um, not restricted to the montane zone at all, but when we get into the montane zone, it becomes particularly common and can dominate on the ground um, over, over big areas because it can tolerate the very harsh climates and the um, very poor thin soils where everything's too, uh, too harsh or poor for other species to um, grow very well. Um, so that's one um, example on, especially on very exposed ground in the montane zone. Um, the next picture has some more of that um, three-leaved rush, the Juncus trifidus, that we had a close-up of uh, a couple of slides back. You see in the foreground there, it's, that, it's got that orangey tinge to it and forms some quite big tufts that, uh, tussocks that kind of coalesce. So it can get very common in some places in, <clears throat> in the very high montane zone um, in the sort of central and east highlands. That's where we find it most, um, most extensively. You know, this is on top of Benaglo in Perthshire. Um, so it's, it's not grass, it's a kind of rush, but it's in the same category. Uh, next picture has <clears throat> some vegetation. Some might think, oh, it looks a bit boring. Uh, but no, even, even quite species poor vegetation uh, can have its interest. It doesn't have to be, it's not like you have to get something very rare in there. It's just, it just is. It's, it's a response to the um, peculiarities of the climate in these places. And this is a sward mainly of stiff sedge that we saw a close up of earlier with that very stiff flowering stem. And um, in certain kinds of habitats, it can dominate. Um, usually on on high ground that's not very steeply sloping and especially where there's a, even a shallow very shallow depression and it can get a little bit moist and hold snow for um, a bit longer than in most parts of the exposed ridge top um, and it grows there accompanied by mosses including the rachimitrium moss that we saw a close-up of earlier and various other mosses and so it's uh, it's quite a distinct habitat that looks kind of vaguely like a grassland, but it's it's a kind of sedge, it's that montane stiff sedge. Um, the next picture shows some um, late snowbed habitat where snow really lies late. This is up in the Cairngorms. And you have to get grasses there. You can get some of the mat grass. You can see some um, in the sort of foreground parts. And you can get wavy hair grass here and there, scattered bits of, and, and tufted hair grass. There's Champsia cespitosa, even very, uh, some of the smallest plants that we find of that. They can get right up into these snow beds, along with um, mosses and liverworts, those, um, and, and stiff sedge, quite a mix of things. It can look almost bare in places, or just like a kind of untidy, waste, disturbed habitat. 
but um, they can be tremendously rich in all kinds of montane, little montane plants. There's, there's a, um, a group of montane liverworts, very small species, Mars Upellus and other species that can, can grow in these places are really quite uncommon. Um, and various um, montane mosses, some particular snowbed mosses, very exciting habitats to be looking at. Um, so uh, it's not really what we would call a grassland, it's, um, it's late snowbed, bryophyte dominated snowbed for most part in this, in this picture. Next uh, picture has some more, even more bryophyte dominated, really without all that um, mat grass that we had in parts of the previous picture. This really is mosses and liverworts here. When you look close in there, you would, you would find, well, I know you find because I've been there, um, things like least willow and little scattered bits of stiff sedge and a few other um, herbs like starry saxifrage actually grows in there. But um, yeah, it, it can look rather, people might look at it and think, oh, it just looks like it's some disturbed ground, maybe like, you know, how you get on some building sites where things have started to regrow. Um, but no, it's just the, the effect of the late line snow, stopping so much else from growing. Everything's, um, you know, the, 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 the vascular cover is um, always constantly limited. Uh, so it's bryophyte dominated, very exciting habitats botanically, these places, um, and not grasslands in the true sense, but they belong in the same category in the MPMS. Next picture is um, grass and um, it's I a question. I have got a question for this one. Hang on, let me just uh, get to the question time. So uh, we'll have to go along for each one as we do them. But I, I know you've got a series of questions on this section. So mm. um, yeah, so the first one is, is for this picture. So we'll give people a wee while, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so what species of grass is in this photo? is the first question and then we can move on to the next slide in a second it's a it's a question the answer of which is referring kind of back quite a long way back we were speaking about this so it's not a question just in case you're thinking oh crikey what on earth is this it's um oh the second question the second yeah, we haven't got to number that one two yet. Isn't, yeah. isn't relevant yet by the way that's you we've got an answer it put down but um it, number two doesn't apply for this photograph um uh yeah so okay and then i'll so, just i'll go forward to the next one as everyone's had a good chance of having a bit of a look at that one so this is number two yeah yeah and then a question here is is this upland grass acid grass in montane or not and then the second question is what or oh, the third question sorry what are the yellow flowers so you can have a look obviously it's quite hard to tell from a photo far away but you could use your best guess <laughs> hmm. like what would be most likely to be in that place yeah and I think everyone can move the polling thing around if it's in the way of the picture. Um, I think, you, yeah, everyone has the ability to do that. So the, to the, the second question, there is a there is a clue in, in the picture, um, yeah. which quite a, lot, quite a lot of people are picking up on, so that's good. And again, the third one, it's um, obviously I've, I've picked three um, yellow flowered plants for you to take a guess from, but if you've been listening to Ben, then you'll probably be choosing the right one, hopefully. <laughs> mm. The other two are species I haven't actually mentioned uh, yes. <laughs> in, in this. <laughs> and one of the grasses is in the first question is uh, this one that I haven't mentioned either. Yeah. <laughs> I've just gone for ones that are easily confusable, I suppose, in a sense. Mm, yeah. 
and obviously as you've said ben the when you're talking about the truly montane that still comes within the whole of the mpms um fine habitat anyway but it's um it's, yeah it's an interesting thing isn't it to, to look at the what is truly montane versus just uplands so. oh absolutely it's really a quite instructive thing it's uh, to to be aware of um, when when you actually are in the montane zone definitely okay right i'll just um i'll end the polling for the minute and share the results um so you can tell that there was quite an even split between the, the two bottom ones for the second question. Mm. Um, and the third question, most people chose Tormental. And for the first question, most people chose wavy hair grass. So um, we can now, you can just get rid of that from your screen and we'll carry on and um, then we'll explain. In a minute and well. um, it is wavy hair grass. Um, the one in the photo on the previous page was indeed wavy hair grass. And uh, that that was a very typical sward of it that develops thick and lush in a place that's had some previous disturbance. And at that particular site, there had been there we are seeing it now. So there's been there been some trees growing there, uh, and they've been felled. I don't know how long before I was there, but some um, not that many years. By the look of it, and <clears throat> that kind of um, disturbance really helps for um, for the wavy hair grass to dominate at least for a while. Um, that was some years ago. It probably won't be like that now. Um, the other one, the number number two, the the answer. So is is it is it um, montane or not? Um, it's not montane because there's some bracken in there. Bracken doesn't go in the montane zone. It's very very common and widespread in the uplands, but not montane. And there was there is a frond of bracken in the right hand part of that um, that photo, um, and the yellow flowers are tormenta, uh, by far the commonest yellow flower where you get yellow dots in um, acid grassland up in the hills. Okay, so um, I'll I'm deleting that thing so that we can um, continue on to. Um, so the next page where we're just looking at the negative, the species that have been classed as NPMS negative indicators for the montane acid grass and fine scale habitats. Um, uh, this is not just the truly montane end of it. This is what's the, what's called the montane acid grass and fine scale habitat, which basically we should be able to, should really should be reading as upland <laughs> to understand it more probably just the, um, the acid side of things in this, uh, this morning's presentation. Uh, nettle is down as a negative indicator for quite a few habitats actually because it increases where there's been some sort of artificially high levels of uh, nutrients input um, causing it to grow well. plants like nettle and the goose grass you can see growing with it there um, it can um, allow certain species to to increase at the expense of others um, creeping thistle to some degree for similar reasons but also disturbance physical disturbance like trampling combination of trampling and eutrophication can lead to an increase in that species um, the other those three grasses though they are listed surprisingly as negative indicators even though they are very common in upland acid grasslands generally and they are part of what defines um, a lot of that vegetation, especially the wavy hair grass, and that, that really is um, uh, one of the things that, that tells us it's an acid grass and as opposed to a neutral or calcareous one. The common Benton and sweet fernal grass we can also find in upland calcareous grasslands too. Um, but they, they are, all three of those grasses are very common right across a wide range of upland grasslands and particularly where it's what we would call unimproved grassland compared with um, agriculturally improved. Of course, the amount of agricultural improvement is, is greatest in the lowlands, but they can go quite well up into the, um, into the hills or at low altitudes in upland parts of the country in the far northwest. Um, so um, the, 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 acid, the grasslands that have been more heavily improved from an agricultural sense tend to have more things like white clover and um, perennial ryegrass in them. 
um, those are really better indicators of that. And Holcus lanatus, the Yorkshire fog, can actually increase quite a lot where there's been um, more of the artificial input of nutrients as well. But common vent and sweet vernal grass and wavy hair grass, less so. And I myself wouldn't regard them as indicators that something's kind of wrong or that there's a poor, some aspects of poor quality of, of habitat. Um, and I've noted in the bottom of that page, that it's surprising that white clover, daisy and crested dog's tail grass are listed as positive indicators um, here, where you might expect certainly the white clover and the daisy, that maybe they will be candidates for negative, especially the white clover, because that's so much a, a reflection of um, higher nutrient levels. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind, if you do have a monitoring plot and you've got common vent sweet vernal grass or wavy hair grass in it, it doesn't really mean that something's wrong there or something something's going downhill. Um, okay, now we can move on to the calcareous side of things, the montane calcareous fine scale habitat. And uh, there's one species more than anything else that defines this because a lot of species are shared between the acid grasslands and the calcareous grasslands, especially among the grasses. Um, but wild thyme is a particular species that um, helps define the calcareous ones. It kind of takes over from heath bed straw. The, the role that heath bed straw has in the acid grasslands has been this low creeping little plant um, of, of acid soils. Well, thyme plays a similar role. It's actually woody, whereas the heath bed straw isn't, of course, but um, it's, its stems are so thin, the scale of the plant is so, so small it kind of looks a bit like a replacement for the heath bed straw. And um, so the amount of the wild thyme compared with the amount of heath bed straw is one of the ways that we can um, separate the, the calcareous and the acid grasslands in the hills. Um, and the next page has a close up of the wild thyme on the left, showing it's kind of typically brownish or even reddish tinged um, woody but very thin stems and little leaves kind of oblong oval leaves in opposite pairs. Leaves are a bit hairy as well but hairiness varies and you have to look pretty close to see those hairs. The, um, the flowers of course are unmistakable when you get them, those little short spikes of, of pink flowers. Um, but another plant that can grow with it in calcareous grasslands, both in the hills and in the lowlands, is rock rose, which is a, again, it's a dwarf shrub, though it's low grown and its stems are very thin. Um, but its leaves are again in evergreen in opposite pairs. And um, in, in flower, it's totally different, of course, because it's got those yellow flowers that look vaguely buttercupish. Um, and even when it's not in flower, you can tell it from time because the leaves are bigger, the plant in general is a bit, bit, bit bigger, um, but its leaves are, are longer and the central vein is cut down in a distinct groove. You can see it, those dark lines in that photo, are dark lines running the length of the middle of the leaf. Um, if you were to turn the leaf over to see the underside, it's much more pale, distinctly paler than the upper side more so than in time. There's not quite so much of a difference between upper and lower surface in time. Um, another difference is that the base of each leaf in the rock rows, you get a couple of tiny things called stipules. They look a bit like miniature leaves, um, a little pair of them at the bottom of each leaf. Uh, you can't quite see them in that photo, I think, but um, you will see them when you, they're looking at the plant. Uh, time doesn't have stipules. Um, they, they are both plants that do particularly well where the soil is very thin and um, on the calcareous side. Uh, rock rose is not so strongly restricted to places with such really thin soils though. It can tolerate being a little bit of a bigger plant, I suppose. It can tolerate a slightly deeper soil and um, can compete a little bit better with swords, slightly thicker swords of grasses and other herbs. And we can find rock rows um, growing in the slightly richer end of, of acid grassland habitats as well. So it's not really restricted to calcareous. It's most common in calcareous grassland, but um, um, 
not restricted to it, whereas time is more, much more concentrated um, in the calcareous grassland. Uh, over the page, we've got um, some more species here that, uh, that are pretty common in the calcareous grasslands. Bird's foot trefoil, it's got leaves like kind of cloverish leaves with three leaflets. Um, but then at the base of the leaf stalk, there's another, there's a couple of stipules, they look like leaflets. So it kind of look like there are five, um, two at the base and then three sticking out all together. Um, slightly greyish tinge is characteristic. And when the flowers are out, those pea type pea like flowers, they're quite unmistakable in combination with those kinds of leaves. Only thing you'll mistake that for possibly um, common species you mistake it for would be the great tip of foot trefoil, which is bigger, leaves aren't so greyish, they're more translucent and it grows in damper places. Fairy flax is unmistakable, very, very thin wiry stems with little oblong oval leaves in um, opposite pairs and these very delicate little white flowers, little branched inflorescence. Uh, everything's very thin and delicate and these wiry stems. That really goes for the calcareous grasslands on very thin soils. Ladies bed straw is unmistakable as well because its leaves are very thin and quite dark and much narrower than those of the other bed straws and you get more of them in a world than most bed straws too. Um, worlds being where all of these come out in one place at one point on the stem, as you probably know. And the flowers are yellow, these little, um, well, they can be quite long actually, um, spikes of, um, of yellow flowers, easy thing to tell. It's funny enough, sometimes you might um, confuse ladies' bed straw, non-flowering ladies' bed straw with bell heather, because the texture of the leaves is so similar, the size and the color, slightly shiny, um, and the lower parts of stems of, of well-grown ladies' bed straw can be quite tough and almost with a woody kind of feel. But you then can always tell that it's not um, bell heather because bell heather's leaves are in whorls of three, um, whereas in ladies' bed straw they've got many more leaves to a whorl, eight to twelve. Um, quaking grass, unmistakable when it's in flower, when it's not in flower, it's quite ordinary looking leaves really, sort of dull green, slightly greyish green, rather broad leaves that don't get too long. Um, very nondescript though, compared with a lot of other grasses. In flower, you'll easily tell it's these um, beautiful flattened spikelets, quite big, dangling there on these very thin stems. Um, so, um, common bird's foot trefoil, by the way, and the lady's bed straw, can um, grow quite commonly in the acid grassland, those forms of the acid grassland that are not too strongly acid. Um, where we find that though, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to tell that we're in an acid grassland and not a calcareous grassland because we wouldn't see the wild thyme and we'd be quite likely to see heath bed straw instead. Uh, Okay, let's go on to the next page and we'll see some more um, species that we can find in upland calcareous grasslands generally. Where it's a bit damp, uh, those two sedges on the left can grow very commonly. And the flea sedge, the first one is less conspicuous uh, than the next one, the glaucus sedge. But the flea sedge, when it's got its um, fruiting spikes out, uh, you'll not mistake it for anything. When they're ripe, you can touch those fruits and they'll sort of jump off. They'll spring away like jumping fleas. The leaves are quite thin and wiry and it's really very inconspicuous thing. It's really just those fruits. Um, before it fruits, when the spikes come out a bit earlier, everything's all the, all the individual um, little flowers are pointing forward. So it's a very narrow spike um, in total, but then um, <clears throat> when the fruits ripen, they stick out and bend slightly backwards and they go a kind of dark, shiny brown colour. Um, it likes it damp and base rich. Glaucus sedge, likewise, but it's um, unmistakable with its greyish green leaves, um, a few millimetres wide, um, and they're particularly pale on their undersides. And those dangling uh, female spikelets are distinctive as well, like sort of big catkins. Uh, Mountain Everlasting is unmistakable too. 
because the leaves, are, they're, they're very small, but they're in kind of little rosettes all bunched up there. And their undersides are very pale, sort of whitish color. And like the Alpine ladies mantle we saw earlier, the, that, that pale color comes right to the edge, of sort of delicate lining around, around the edge of each leaf. Um, nothing else like that. It likes, a very, likes to have some space, so very thin soils or stony, rocky ground, just like in that picture. Um, and little tufts, little, little um, groups of whitish, dull white to very pale pink flowers. But you can tell it by the leaves very, very easily, so you don't have to have the flowers there. Limestone bed straw looks very much like heath bed straw, but it can grow a bit taller, the leaves a little bit longer. And um, if in doubt, the thing to do is to <clears throat> look close, especially if you've got a hand lens, look at the leaves and um, in both species, there are little tiny hairs along the edges of the leaves. In heath bed straw, they point forwards. In limestone bed straw, they point backwards. So the leaf will have a very slightly rougher texture. It's nothing like as common as limestone bed straw. But if you see a little white flowered bed straw growing with wild thyme, it's worth checking out because it might be the um, limestone bed straw. And the meadow oak grass, there, that can get quite big and tufted and tusky. Um, quite tall, those flowering heads with those stiff, long, shiny spikelets on them, branched flower heads. Um, without the flowers, you can still tell it because it's a pretty dense tuft of leaves. And the leaves, um, the distinctive thing about the leaves is that they're parallel sided and then they taper quite abruptly at the tip. They're not the only ones to do that, but that the combination of that shape and the colour being a kind of greyish green on the upper side and a darker, more shiny green underneath is, um, that, that, that'll do it, identify it, it will. So um, it's an unusual thing to find um, a leaf that's got that darker, shinier green underneath and a rather paler, greyish green and not shiny colour on the upper surface. The only other thing that really has that is bottle sedge which of course grows in much, much, much wetter places. There's kind of no habitat overlap between those species. And bottle sedge leaves taper very gradually to their points, whereas meadow oak grass leaves taper very abruptly and the leaves are quite stiff. Um, so it's that unusual thing of the upper side and the underside, the, the um, arrangement of colours, very distinct. Uh, next page, we've got the Cesileria grass, um, the blue moor grass. This is a photo taken relatively late in the season, so the flower heads, which start off much darker, have gone quite pale. Um, I'm hoping to get a photograph of some um, still dark flower heads in the next couple of days, because uh, my wife Alice and I are going to be taking a look at some upland in the North Pennines, just for a change. I haven't really been down there to have a proper look around. And um, you do get Cesleria grassland quite a bit in there. It's very, very local in Britain. It's just a band across the middle of Britain from Cumbria across um, sort of Yorkshire, County Durham, where, where you get it mainly. It's also on some cliff ledges and things in parts of the Scottish Highlands, but not forming a grassland sward. And in um, the west of Ireland as well. Uh, distinctive thing, it's got these dense tufts of bluish grey leaves, which whose tips are again um, uh, quite abruptly pointed. And then these, yeah, these funny little small, unbranched, dense flower heads. They start off dark and then they go pale. Uh, as I'd mentioned earlier on, the NPMS guidance tells us that where you get Cesleria grassland, we're supposed to put it in with into the lowland grassland NPMS type. Which is a funny thing because oh, some of it is lowland, as in that photo there. Actually, that's taken in lowland, sort of County Durham. Um, but it does also go very much into the uplands of the Pennines um, and around the edges of the Lake District as well. You can find it in some places. Uh, but yeah, it says put it in with the um, lowland grasslands. So that's what we have to do. Um, Anyway, the next well, the next page has some upland calcareous grassland that's got you see the yellow flowers of the rock rose, loads of it. There's thyme in there, although funnily enough, some of that thyme, thyme has got white flowers occasionally. So many plants that have blue or pink flowers can occasionally produce white ones, uh, perhaps in response to certain soil conditions. 
Um, so that's quite a rich, um, species rich calcareous grassland growing on limestone in Perthshire. And um, the um, next page has got some close ups of some of the species that we would get if we were get more if we were going into the truly montane um, zone in calcareous grasslands. These, these species, in some places, they can actually come lower down into non-montane habitats, but still upland, very, very much upland plants, um, and, they, and they become commonest in the montane zone. Um, northern bedstraw is easy one to tell because the leaves are always in whirls of four, and they're quite big for bedstraw leaves, the, the, the individual leaves. Um, there's another plant called crosswort that's related, related to bedstraws and has got whirls in leaves, I'm mean, sorry, leaves in whirls of four, but crosswort has got a much thicker stem and it's very hairy, whereas northern bedstraw has got a thinner stem and it's not hairy. You'd never mistake the two species. Um, Purple saxifrage, distinct big purpley flowers that come out very early in the year. It's still cold, but um, you wouldn't think it could do that, but they do. Uh, without the flowers, it looks a bit like wild thyme in some respects, because the leaves are in opposite pairs. They're similarly small. Um, they, they've got hairs on their edges, but they're more crowded together than the leaves of wild thyme. And it does that thing that some plants with leaves in opposite pairs do, where you get one pair of leaves um, sticking out, obviously, 180 degrees from each other, and then the next pair of leaves up the stem, the, um, they're, they're, it's like they're twisted around 90 degrees and, it, and so they alternate so that when you look down as you can see in that photograph some of the stems there it looks like they're in four ranks um, and they're all very the leaves are relatively short and they're very close very sort of clustered together um, yellow saxifrage has got rather fleshy leaves as well but you can't really see them that well in that photo because it's um, got so many of these of the beautiful yellow flowers that are quite big for the size of the plants and they're in these branched heads um, and that likes damp ground damp flushed especially um, calcareous flushes stony flushes in the hills but also sort of um, slightly flushed damp grassland um, the stem can be quite reddish and the leaves are parallel sided uh, they're reasonable length they're maybe a centimeter or so long um, and with little hairs on their edges and they stick out all directions around the stem so even um, flowerless um, non-flowering non, non, non specimens can be quite distinct quite easy to tell and the bistorts um, when it's in flower like that with those white flowers at the tops of the um, flower heads it's very easy to identify and the, you get bulb bills developing um, sort of a brown, you know, brownish, you can see them, those sort of brownish colored bulb bills on the flowering heads. The leaves are distinct, we'll see them in another picture in a bit. They're narrow, quite narrow, sort of oval color, uh, fairly dull green above, but on the underside they're paler and the central vein stands out um, very conspicuously raised up from the rest of the um, underside of the leaf, nothing else like it. Um, and the central vein is kind of quite glossy looking, whereas the rest of the leaf texture is, is more on the matte side. Uh, some more montane species on the next page. We've got um, another picture of Alpine Ladies Mantle, which we saw with the acid grasslands, those starry leaves with pale edges. Um, hair sedge is very small little sedge, has little tufts, little tufts of yellowy green leaves and particularly distinctive thing about it is the female spikelets are on these long wiry sort of hair like stalks. Quite an uncommon plant of especially dampish montane calcareous grasslands. And mountain avens, you never mistake that for anything, it's a, it's a little dwarf shrub that can form quite big patches here and there, creeping low over the ground, these evergreen leaves that look a bit like evergreen, an evergreen kind of oak really with those wobbly edges and a very pale undersurface um, with the flowers out, obviously nothing else, like it's a bit like, a bit like a wooden emily flower kind of, and then they turn into these funny fluffy fruits, but the leaves um, will always identify it. It's not very common, it does like uh, especially limestone places, but other kinds of base rich rock as well, like basalt. Um, 
So um, now we've got the next page is um, looking more at the sort of plant community level in the mon in the truly montane um, uh, zone here we've got some um, uh, calcareous grassland in which we've got that alpine bistort again it's too far away to really see in that photo um, but there's a we'll see a closer a slightly closer view of the leaves in a bit and yellow flowers of the um, the yellow saxophage dotted through it there and um, that's on some um, limestone and the next page has got a uh, sward with an abundance of the alpine ladies mantle and you can see there's some wild thyme, bits of wild thyme in there. So it's an upland calcareous grassland of a montane type. Um, the next one after this has got some of the moss campion. It's another um, montane species that can be quite common in some of the more truly montane calcareous grasslands. Uh, related to red campion and white campion, but much smaller. The flowers are a lot smaller and the leaves especially are really small, but they're quite tough textured leaves. They're, they're very narrow, almost linear, but, um, but quite thick, very tough. And the whole plant forms dense mass, hence the name moss campion, because it's so, sort of, it looks like a sort of giant moss in a way, and with these, these pink flowers. Um, and usually it has to go pretty high up to up in the mountains to find it or in some places in the West Highlands it actually comes down low. Um, okay the next page has got uh, an example of that kind of way that some of these montane species can come down low in the far northwest. This is in West Sutherland um, on some limestone and there's a whole load of um, mountain avens, dryas growing there uh, with white white flowers in what is otherwise a, a vegetation that's like a, a sort of standard, more of a standard upland calcareous grassland, of, of upland but not particularly montane, but the dryas um, can get there because the, that far northwest summers are really on the cool side and it's good enough for a lot of montane species to do very well. I see it says somebody's raised a hand. Um, I don't know if... Uh, um, yeah, um, Diane, if you want to um, ask a question for Ben, um, just put it in the Q&A, or if it's something specific to do with maybe Zoom or something, just, just note it in the, in the chat function, um, and I'll try and answer it as we go along. Okay. Okay, thanks, yeah. Um, the there's no, next page, we can move on. Um, not too far from the end, and I, I don't want to be too slow so we're all dragging going behind time um so or over time i should say uh yeah question page so um i see you've got a poll thing rigged up for it uh saying um which is it and then yeah the second the second question on there relates to a picture we haven't seen yet that's going to be in a couple of pages time so um so yeah, I'll just I'll give everyone a little bit of a minute to have a little think about these three pictures and which ones they are, um, and just put in your votes. Remember, it's all anonymous, so I don't know. I won't be making any marks or reviews on anyone. <laughs> and obviously, it's tricky because it's vegetatively. So that's right. I haven't got the flowers. That's deliberate. Yes, of course. Because otherwise, we don't, it would have been, we, would have yeah. been easy. we don't often always get them with the flowers, which is nice. And, you know, even if even if you're a complete beginner and, you know, you're normally used to doing this, um, you know, sort of only with the bits with flowers or whatever, then just give it a go anyway, because, you know, there's nothing to lose, really. And, um, yeah, as Ben was saying, we haven't got to the second question yet about the yellow flower. Um, Diane, Some I can people. see you keep raising your hand. Unfortunately, we can't come to you, Diane. So you have to just make a little note in the chat if you want to say something. Um, this just being a webinar, we, you can't sort of speak or anything. Um, but yeah, so we haven't got to the second question about the yellow flower yet. This is just asking which out of those ones in what order. So top, middle and bottom. Some people can see into the future. Oh, that's maybe, maybe. That, yeah. That second question. I'll go, I'll go across to the first one and then I'll go back to it again so that everyone can I can look at both options. Oh, actually, no, because it gives you the answer, doesn't it, on the next slide up there? 
<laughs> the next slide gives the answers. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. I'll just give it a, just a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> um, we might get some feedback on this that nobody likes doing the questions, but um, it's uh, we've got um, one of our new trainers coming on next week, and she really wanted to do some polls and questions. So um, I'm sort of trialing it out a little bit and seeing seeing how well it goes. Um, you know, and we're always learning. So, um, but it's a useful feature nonetheless. So. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. rather than just talking out to the ether, I suppose. Oh, uh, oh, <laughs> that's okay, Diane. No worries about accidentally ra raising your hand. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> we'll know that if it happens again, it was an accident. Um, right, well, for the sake of uh, who's probably had a go at the first one, we will go on to the answer. Um, great. Oh, and somebody said they're happy with the questions, so that's nice. That's good. Uh, so here there are the answers. So Ben, I'll just let you go through. And the majority of the answers were the correct one. Purple yep. saxophrase the top, and then time, and then rockers. Well done. Um, and to repeat, you see the purple saxophrage. Those um, that uh, with that more distinct, uh, looking like they're in four ranks. Look, I mean, you get something of that effect on the other species, but it's more marked in the purple saxophrage because the leaves are all so much closer together. Um, and they're short, really quite short leaves as well. Um, and then the time looking more ordinary, or sort of more ordinarily oval leaf. Um, the thing about the saxifrage leaf is that it's relatively broad at its base as well, whereas the thyme leaf and the rockers leaf, they start off a bit narrower at the base, more like so many ordinary oval leaves. Um, and the rockers, they're those grooves is bigger and the that central vein sunk in a um, a groove running across the surface of the leaf that dark line is very distinct um, so that's good um, I'm intrigued that people have answered this the second one without that I, I don't know if there's people who uh, some people have, if some people can see into the future or if <laughs> <laughs> Is incredible, but um, yeah. So this is, or, this is the last one. So have a guess at what this one is. <laughs> or <laughs> if they've seen it on a um, last year and and remembered. Ah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's people seeing into the future. <laughs> this is quite a tricky one, I think, in a way. Um, it is. Yeah, potentially tricky. Yeah, potentially. There's potentially a bit of a, uh, potentially a, almost a trick question or a sneaky. Yes, but yeah, um, which it, for me to have asked. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but you know, you have a go, have a go, and we'll see. Right, should we put everyone out of their misery then, Ben? And go yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the alpine um, sanquifoil, and um, for which, yeah, super, more people have thought the the creeping sanquifoil, which is more of a lowland species, really, um, and it's a. Uh, I'm just going to click off that whole thing, so don't need to do that anymore. Um, yeah, the alpine sanquifoil, um, it's not such a big and creeping thing as the, um, as a creeping one. Uh, this distinctly upland or montane plant really with leaves in groups or well, um, five, five leaflets. And it, otherwise the leaves are very much like tormental leaves, just a bit bigger but, um, in fives, not threes. Um, and the flower with five petals, so it's you know, fives all around more or less. But as I say, you can get the occasional tormental flower with um, five petals, then you just need to check the leaves and you'll know straight away it's tormental. Um, but it's, yeah, the alpine sanquifoil is a plant of um, base rich, like limestone or schists, those kinds of rocks um, up in mountain areas. Growing in um, on cliff ledges, you can find it, and in short, uh, variably grazed calcareous grassland, beautiful plants. And those those orange dots at the base of the petals are very conspicuous, um, particularly conspicuous in that species. 
Um, the picture of the photo on the right has also got a couple of leaves of the alpine bistel. There's one um, in the or very centre, very slightly to the right of centre in that photo, and another one slightly above left of centre. See those? The leaves, the leaves are about this similar shape to the leaves of heart's tongue fern, actually, but much smaller. And without that um, more of a heart-shaped base that you can get in heart's tongue fern, um, uh, the more gradually tapering at the base. You see how it looks just so ordinary, uh, just a sort of green, mid-green on that upper surface. Mid to dark, they can actually be a rather dark looking. Um, but if you turn that leaf over, um, it's much paler underneath and that central vein stands out. It, the, the underside is a kind of pale, slightly glaucous, slightly bluey green, except, that, except for the um, main vein, which stands out. It's kind of raised from it and it's shiny and it's more of a kind of pale and if anything, very slightly yellowy green. So it's like it's made out of different material. So that un the underside of the leaf will um, identify it really, really um, definitely. I think that's us pretty much almost at the end now because the next picture is um, just taking a look at the negative indicators here. We had them for the acid ones and now for the calcareous. Um, this, the first two species, the same, nettle and creeping thistle for the same reasons. But then the um, the other ones, um, the dockens, the big broadleaf or curled dock, uh, they like some nutrient enrichment and or ground disturbance. Um, ragwort is a um, negative indicator for being a toxic thing to animals, that's one reason why. And it can do very well in places where there's been a lot of trampling, grazing and, tra and trampling um, that opens up a bit of habitat here and there on a very small scale and gives it a competitive edge. Um, and that same amount of grazing and trampling might be heavy enough to have other sort of negative effects on other aspects of the vegetation, like reducing the amount of, of flowering of some species. Um, creeping buttercup, that does do very well where there's been more nutrient enrichment um, and also some ground disturbance as well. So there's quite a lot of sharing among those five species in sharing in terms of what it is that they can suggest about the habitat that uh, is potentially kind of damaging or reducing its um, biodiversity value. Uh, not always, you know, you might find a bit of ragwort or a bit of thistle or something within habitat and basically being, being okay. So yeah, the more there is of them, the more abundance there is of them, um, that's more of a concern. Um, and then that's almost at the end is just the last page which is saying thank you for um for coming along uh, virtually and having the patience to go through all this for, and i hope this sort of tour of everything going whizzing through these grasslands has been of interest and will be of use uh to what you're doing in the mpms and um yeah thank you Great, thank you so much, Ben. Um, it's it's always a pleasure, and I know everyone really really enjoys it. Um, so I'll just try and go through just some of the little um, uh, questions that have coming up. Uh, so there was a question back up at the beginning. Um, oh, uh, a lady was saying uh, she has stag's horn club moss in her square, and does that fit with the alpine and fir club mosses? Um. It, from the purpose of uh, point of view of identification, uh, uh, she might or, be. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly. So maybe cover ID yeah. and then versus uh, maybe fitting in with the habitat type or something. Sure. Yeah, for identification pretty straightforward. It's um, it doesn't look like either of those two. It's a creeping branch thing. Creeps low over the ground like a sort of giant branched creeping moss, and um, its leaves have white hair points at their tips. So it's unmistakable from that point of view. Uh, habitats, it grows in quite a wide range of habitats, especially on um, rather thin acid, nutrient poor soils. So we can find it here and there 
in some kind of acid grassland, but it's particularly common where there's been some disturbance or something that keeps it open. Like, so if the ground is stony, uh, maybe at the edges of a forest track, that kind of thing. It's not uh, not a usual thing to find in uh, grassland sward, but here and there, yeah, if it's open enough, you might find it among grassland or heath. Okay, thank you. Um, interestingly, we've had a sort of mix of feedback about the question format. So some people really like the questions and other people think that it maybe takes a bit long. So it's a bit difficult one to please everybody. So maybe I'll, I'll try and do an evaluation on that. Um, the other thing is somebody said about um, feedback in terms of if you could see Ben's cursor. But the problem is um, regarding that is that I'm the one sharing my screen and not Ben. And that's because of the fact that uh, he hasn't got the bandwidth to do so. Um, so in terms of sort of zooming in and, and out of slides, um, a version of this presentation in a non narrate sort of um, just as a PDF will is available already on our online training section of the website where you can view each page in your own time so if you wanted to look at any pictures closer then you can go and do that and this is this web one's already on there from last year um so hopefully that will be useful um and in i'm just looking to see if there's any other specific questions uh not necessarily um, it must have been that you covered it so well, Ben, that everyone is totally understanding of this habitat now um, and hasn't got any more specific questions for you. Um, mm, yeah, good. so, well, I, yeah. I, I've just seen, I'm just looking actually now at the at the um, chat thing and I've yeah. seen the question, yeah, about the Stags or Clumbos, how does that fit with it? Maybe that also means ecologically in terms of montaneness. It's not montane. Yeah. Um, it goes right down low low as well um, in case that also helps uh, yeah yeah whereas the other ones are more definite upland okay the, yes thank you for that clarification. And I know that she mentioned she had to dash off so she was going to watch this the answer on the recording so hopefully that's answered for her um, mm. and also just some more thank yous from people um, particularly saying that they can recognize more and more plants now as she's been coming to lots of them so it you know it's obviously working and sinking in um i think somebody's got slightly confused asking about how's the guinea pig that was dominic price um not ben avaris but um i'm sure i can i can say that, that dominic price's guinea pig is fine from what i last heard so um <laughs> and if nobody's got any more questions then i think we will leave ben to go off and have his lunch um, and for anyone that's hoping to come to our next webinar, it um, should be next Tuesday with Sue Bell this time, who Ben, I believe you know, discussing yeah. mm. fre freshwater, uh, NPMS freshwater habitat. So it should be another really great one. So yeah, great. Thanks everyone for attending and um, see you at the next one. Thanks, okay. Ben. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.